Thank you. Well, it is indeed a great pleasure to be here tonight, and I hope that you can hear me. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge a few people. Mr. Max K, AM President of the National Trust. The Honourable Michael Murray, AMQC, Chairman of the National Trust. Mr. Julian Donaldson, Chief Executive Officer. Mrs. Sue Murphy, Chief Executive Officer, Water Corporation, Distinguished Guests All. And I also would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the place on which we meet, the Noongar people, and pay my respect to their elders past and present. And I should say that this occasion has a very special significance for me because I worked for 17 years at Fremantle Ports. And every day arriving at the port, I would pass Porcelli's statue of C.Y. O'Connor. Every day I was working in an environment which he created where because the inner harbour he designed was so far-sighted, his influence is still palpable. I feel honoured, therefore, to be invited to give this memorial lecture today. In recognising and celebrating his legacy to us, I would like to focus in some detail on the building of the inner harbour. Of course, he was also responsible, as mentioned, for other major works in Western Australia, in particular the development of the railway system and the goldfields pipeline. But his achievement in planning the harbour, fighting to get it approved, and supervising its construction shows every aspect of his complex genius and highlights many personal qualities. In order to understand the greatness of his achievement, we have to consider the context in which he was operating. In 1891, Western Australia could have been described, obviously with some exaggeration, as the Southern Hemisphere version of the Wild West. The Swan River colony had struggled in its early years, finally introducing convicts in 1850 to increase the size of its labour force. Gradually, there were signs of progress. We had bridges, roads and railways being built. The agriculture and timber industries developed. And in the 1880s to 1890s, there were a number of, of gold discoveries, initially of moderate size. A stock exchange was established in 1888 and a chamber of commerce in 1890. At last, the British Parliament agreed to grant self-government which was proclaimed on the 28th of October, 1891. The new legislature ha had the two houses, the Legislative Assembly and the Legislative Council, with Sir John Forrester's Premier. So it was quite a stirring time. Forrest was full of ideas for development, but resources, both financial and human, were lacking. And the infrastructure was required at that time. In most respects, WA was an unsophisticated place with a few experts on hand and a press that was lively but could turn irrationally savage. In 1891, there was a real need for a better transport system, in particular better railways and a harbour near, at or near to Fremantle, where access to the sea came from the Swan River and that was obstructed by a rocky bar across its mouth, which had proved a stumbling block from the colony right from the beginning. Even the river itself, shallow near its mouth, could be hazardous to traffic, as happened in 1869 when Queen Victoria's second son, the then Duke of Edinburgh, was travelling by barge from Fremantle to Perth. Michael Bosworth, in his book Convict Fremantle, reports on what happened. Unhappily, the tide was low and the vessel struck one of the many sandbars in the Fremantle Channel. A gang of convicts respectfully leapt into the water and deferentially heaved the boat over an obstruction. So you can see there was a problem. A couple of proposals were put forward as early as the 1830s for a harbour at the mouth of the river, but the cost was considered prohibitive. Then, early in 1837, a small jetty was built by prison labour for the Fremantle Whaling Company at Bathers Bay. Incoming goods were unloaded there and transported by road to the river jetty at the end of High Street and sent up the river to Perth. The jetty was later extended, but the unprotected jetty was never satisfactory. Many ships laid at anchor 
while goods were transferred by lighter to Fremantle, and then the double handling and, in, in some respects, quadruple handling, led to excessive costs. The situation was so difficult that from 1852, the mail ships coming to Western Australia all used Albany as their port of call, and that situation was to continue for some 50 years. The road between Albany and Perth was rough, and uh, it was a bush track which took the fastest coach <clears throat> at least four days to cover. For most travellers, it was an uncomfortable week's journey. More plans for a safe harbour developed over the years, but in the end, another jetty was built outside the river, the famous Long Jetty, running in a southwesterly direction from Arthur's Head. And this is a photo of the jetty. It was constructed in, 1860, uh, in 1873, extended in 1881 and again in 1883, taking it to well over a kilometre. At last, somewhat larger vessels could be accommodated, but only those with a dra draft of 12 feet, or up to 12 feet, and only then in fine weather. There was no protection from bad weather. At best, it was a makeshift solution, and a southwesterly gale did so much damage to one ship that its master declared, and I quote, it is certainly the worst place I ever saw. No place to send a ship of this size. I would not come to this port again and be obliged to discharge this wharf if they made me a present of the vessel. So the search for a long-term solution continued, and between 1830 and 1891, there were reportedly 25 known port proposals which were never implemented. In the early 1870s, three Victorian engineers recommended siting the harbour in Coburn Sound. They were convinced that any breakwater out from Rouse Head or Arthur Head to create a harbour in the inner harbour would result in a coastal sand drift that would inevitably silt up the harbour mouth. Sir John Coode, an eminent British engineer, was consulted in 1877. And working from Britain on the information provided, he too believed that a harbour in the Swan River was out of the question because of the potential for sand drift. He prepared two plans, both for an external harbour. One would run northwest from Rouse Head, the other southwest from Arthur Head. Even the less costly off option was too expensive at an estimated cost of £242,000. So no further action was taken for some time. In 1866, Sir John Coode came out from Britain to inspect the site and spent five weeks in the area. He report, his report the following year advocated something very similar to his earlier Arthur Head option. It was for an open timber viaduct running out from Arthur Head that would provide 2,600 feet of wharfage in water that at low tide would be 22 to 29 feet deep. So that's a lot better than the 12 feet. I should say that I'm indebted to Fremantle Ports for the maps, graphs and photos I'm using today. And this one shows Sir, Gon Sir John Coode's design. The estimated cost, including a dredging plant, was close to 500,000 pounds way beyond the £150,000 that had been the locals had in mind to spend. Sir John said that it was impossible to do anything useful with that amount, and so there the, amount, the matter rested. Just for interest, this is a, a map of one of the earlier designs, uh, and this was an 1875 design. Breakwaters in deep water are very expensive to build out, and you can see the huge breakwater required for this design for a relatively small protected port site. When you look later at this, how the size of ships has grown, you can see why I say that C.Y. O'Connor's design was very far sighted. After Sir John Coode's 1887 design, there the matter rested until March 1891, when Sir John Forrest attended the National Australasian Convention in Sydney and he heard praise from, from the New Zealand representatives for a young engineer who sounded exactly like the kind of person that was needed in Western Australia to make him realise his dream of a Western Australia or of a Perth that was fully connected to the rest of Australia 
by rail, by sea and by telegraph. Charles Yelverton O'Connor was at that time 48 years of age and of, as, we, as we've heard, of Protestant Irish extraction and he'd travelled out to New Zealand at the age of 21 looking for challenging work and he gained a wealth of experience there over the years. He had in fact successfully built uh, harbours on the treacherous west coast of the South Island including one at Westport where previous moles and wharfs had been demolished by the sea. He also had remarkable managerial skills, a great talent for organisation, a reputation for, hard deal for fair dealing and a huge capacity for hard work. Alexandra Hasluck in her biographical account of his life claims that in 25 years of continuous service in New Zealand he took only one week's leave. So no wonder that Sir John Forrest jumped at the chance and made him an immediate offer. And after some negotiation, he was appointed to a permanent position as Engineer-in-Chief in Western Australia at a salary of £1,200 a year. O'Connor and his family arrived in WA in May 1891, disembarking, of course, in Albany. He reached Fremantle on the 1st of June and commenced work the next day. He was probably rather startled to find that despite his responsibility for a huge program of work, he had no department at all and was starting with no staff. He may have been the engineer in chief, but at that time he wasn't in charge of much at all in terms of staff. But the pro top projects competing for his immediate attention were the railways and the harbour. But when it came to the harbour, Sir John Forrest had complete faith in Sir John Coode's advice on the harbour and that it had to be placed outside the harbour mouth. At the same time, he strongly favoured a location in Owen Anchorage in Coburn Point, just north of Woodman Point and east of Karnak Island, which was the cheapest option. O'Connor, however, set to work by first studying the many and varied schemes that had been put forward. His approach was a scientific approach that was evidence-based. He had borings taken from the rocky bar at the river mouth that had seemed so impregnable and came to the conclusion that it could easily be broken up and dredged out to create an entrance channel. As for the sand drift, tests convinced him that Sir John Coode's design concerns were based on inaccurate information that had been provided to him. O'Connor concluded that it would be practical and economical to remove the obstructing bar, deepen the area within the river mouth and to keep it clear by dredging. An extensive sheltered harbour could be created within the estuary at the mouth of the Swan River to satisfy forest demands and at a cost consistent with available resources. By the end of the year, he had developed a plan that involved blasting an entry into the estuary, building a north and south mole to protect the entrance, dredging an outer channel and an inner basin and building a wharf. This was his initial very clever plan. Land was to be reclaimed on both sides of the river and retaining walls built. The land to be reclaimed included that occupied by the cramped railway workshops, which, another strategic decision, but very unpopular in Fremantle at the time, were to be moved to Midland, where the lines met. This, this slide shows particularly clearly the extent of the reclamation, and it highlights the narrow isthmus which worried CY because he knew that he needed to ensure that northwesterly storms couldn't break through. In financial terms, O'Connor was proposing a completely protected harbour with more wharf space and greater depth than Coods and for about the same cost. The Premier, however, still had his preference for Owen Anchorage and in the end the matter went to a joint parliamentary committee for examination. The committee sat for seven days and listened to a range of evidence the committee resolved that the scheme recommended by the Engineer-in-Chief be adopted. It's worth noting that this committee was the first of its kind convened by the Infant Parliament of Western Australia 
And some of the questioning, especially of O'Connor, was provocative in the extreme. He responded to that needling with dignity and patience, explaining that there was no real conflict between his ideas and those of Sir John Coode, whose plans for Westport Harbour he had worked on in New Zealand and whom he had corresponded with about Fremantle Harbour. One of O'Connor's biographers, Tony Evans, has written with feeling about his conduct through the harrowing committee process. And he says, he gave concise, clear answers that although in support of his preference for a harbour at the river entrance, never appeared to overstate or embellish the case. It is of no exaggeration to say that one of the finest and most successful ports in Australia, which lay the foundations for the colony's subsequent mercantile success, owes its existence to the evidence O'Connor submitted over those three critical days. I thought I would show you a graph used by a former work colleague, Steve Wade, from Fremantle Ports, which shows the accelerated population growth, which you could say was facilitated by the infrastructure and also the gold rush in the 1890s. And it makes one wonder what would have happened without the infrastructure. Now, a bill for O'Connor's scheme was introduced into Parliament on the 6th of March, 1892, but not passed until January, 1893, partly due to the Premier's lingering doubts about the whole thing. Work started, though, on 16th of November, 1892, when the then Governor's wife, Lady Robinson, tilted the first truckload of rubble for the North Mole onto, on Rouse Head. Sir John Forrest spoke on this occasion, acknowledging his doubts about the cost of the venture and the risk associated with it, and placing the responsibility firmly on O'Connor's head. And he said, but the engineer in chief stuck to his scheme. He urged it with all his power and parliament decided he should have the works as he planned them. In this action of the engineer, we see the character of the man he was not afraid to take on responsibility of this great work. I believe in him. We have an able and energetic, a brave and self-reliant man. And I only hope in this great work he's undertaken that he will be successful. So there's praise from the Premier, but some uh, laying off the blame as well. Throughout construction, and this is a photo of the construction in 1896, a year before the Inner Harbour opened, O'Connor had to keep reassuring the Premier, but it must be said that Sir John Forrest became a stalwart supporter of his engineer-in-chief from then on. The work went according to plan, and under O'Connor's close supervision, he was on site almost daily, inspecting on foot and on horseback and modifying the original plans as he foresaw fit. The morgues extended out and the heavy blasting proceeded without incident, as did the dredging operations. Finally, on March, uh, sorry, on the 4th of May, 1897, less than six years after he arrived in Western Australia, the Sultan, which was a ship of 2,062 tonnes that for many years was to be on the Fremantle-Singapore run, came to berth in the inner harbour with full flags flying. Others soon followed. The German SS Jira was the first male to enter. A few days lo later, the Longfer first Royal Mail steamer arrived, with the RMS India of the P&O line following a week later. My firma, former work colleague, engineer Steve Wade from Fremantle Ports, made a comment about CY that I think illustrates both very different times and a man of incredible persistence and persuasiveness. So he arrived in WA in June 1891. The project was given staged in principal approval in March 1892, and the first rock was placed on North Mole in November 1892. So about a year and a half from his arrival to obtaining staged approval for a project that was going to cost about 50% of state revenue at that time to placement of the first rock is a very impressive achievement, and particularly when you look at it today's context. The, 
the other impressive part was the, the use of marginal wharf structures, in other words, not jetties, but wharfs around the edge, showed enormous foresight and courage, both in selecting the format in the late 1890s and then to be the first port in Australia to do so ahead of Melbourne in 1917 and Sydney in 1929. Now, work on the harbour wasn't completed until after his tragic death in 1902, but he left minutely detailed instructions for what had to be done and they were carried out. And the stand he took on the harbour has been entirely vindicated over the years. These are some of the plans from around 1904-05. First, the as-completed plan, which shows that there was only a need for one finger wharf. And then a photo of fishing from that wharf, so that was people fishing from that finger wharf. And finally, a photo from Rouse Head looking east. And I think that this photo is really interesting because it shows the huge width of the harbour compared to the size of the ships at that time. Now, the wharves have required upgrading from wood to concrete uh, and strengthening. Dredging has been required to handle the larger ships. And the, the land areas had to be expanded to handle containers. But the design of the breakwaters and the inner harbour design has remained and has not fundamentally changed. What I find interesting about this next photo, which is from the 1950s, is it shows how narrow the land area of harbour near Rouse Head was prior to containerisation. And you can see why he was worried about the storms breaking through. You can see from this much more recent aerial photo that the extra land required to have efficient cargo operations has been reclaimed, as with many over overseas ports, from the sea using dredge material. But again, you can see that the inner harbour has remained the same as in his initial design. Now, in the 1920s, there seems to have been discussion about expansion again, as evident from this 1929 plan from Sir Alan Alexander Gibbon partner. However, I think uh, one of the reasons that didn't occur was that with the 1930s depression, there wasn't the same need. I mentioned the flexibility of O'Connor's design because the ship size has increased a lot since 1897. And you can see this one where it's drawn to scale. I find the changes amazing when you consider that the harbour basin has remained unchanged. So in the last 50 years also, the length of ships has continued to increase. Large ships calling include the CGMA CGM Chopin at 277 metres, the MSC Bucks Cliff at 299.9 metres, and the Queen Mary at 345 metres, which is the longest ship currently visiting Fremantle ports. With the harbour just over 400 metres wide, it is great that with current technology to ensure accurate positioning, this ship can visit the inner harbour and swing in the inner harbour basin, again indicating that flexibility of design. Many believe the Fremantle Harbour to be C.Y. O'Connor's greatest feat of engineering. The project also required management skills, communication and negotiation skills, enormous capacity for work, tireless perseverance and attention to detail. Above all, it required extraordinary character to remain steadfast in his views and not to be swayed by anything but the evidence. This steadfastness is but one message I think we can learn from his legacy. It was 2008 when I left Fremantle Ports after 17 years as CEO. So things changed tremendously over that 17 years and changes continue to pace. But the inner harbour works very efficiently. Our state was all the better for C.Y. O'Connor's skills as, has been, as it has been also for the skills of those who followed him. Innovation and inventiveness by our engineers and our scientists will also be critical to our future success. STEM, that is science, technology, engineering and maths education, is going to be more crucial than ever in the world of the future, with disruption arising from technology. 
It has been predicted that 40% of the jobs which exist now uh, are going to disappear because of computerisation. And Australia's former chief uh, scientist has indicated that 75% of the fastest growing jobs in the future will require STEM skills. Disruption is very important for our progress. You, you never know where disruption will arise from. And in that regard, I'd like to share a story about a young Sydney PhD graduate in engineering physics who was working in the Netherlands at the time, John O'Sullivan. He was trying to measure the pulses emanating from exploding black holes. And he adapted a set of mathematical equations called Fourier transforms to radio astronomy and optics to cut through the atmospheric distortion and enable sharp images. A further development based on this innovation is now used in a billion devices every day and has earned the Australian science community hundreds of millions of dollars and led to O'Sullivan being awarded the Prime Minister's Prize for Science. He completed his subsequent work in the late 1880s, several years before the World Wide Web. And a number of you may remember that time where there was just email and some specialised computer services. He started thinking that if you could just remove the need for wires to connect your computer and have portable computing and be able to access networks at full data rates, there would be huge potential. The problem that needed to be solved was that in offices, cafes and other places where portable computing was desirable, reverberation from waves bouncing off objects would cause unclear reception. And the solution had to be small and inexpensive because it had to fit in a laptop. O'Sullivan knew the answer laid in his earlier work with Fourier transforms. And he began the work of building the equations into a tiny chip that would split signals into various tones and reassemble them quickly. Rather than send a signal as one high-speed data stream, he and his colleagues did it in parallel. It was a bit like a motorway sending 100 messages at a million flashes per second. There was a lot of other work, but by 1992, testing soon began on signalling and sending and receiving computer signals over the air. The wireless local area network internet connection was born, and O'Sullivan and his team were not the only ones seeking the breakthrough, but they were the quickest and the best. So that invention came out of pioneering research in radio astronomy and involved fast Fourier transforms as well as detailed knowledge about radio waves and their behaviour in environments. The team working on it included John O'Sullivan and four colleagues from the CSIRO. So radio astronomy has driven innovation, not only in Wi-Fi technology, but also in a variety of other areas now fundamental to our way of life, including GPS navigation and medical imaging. And I should say that John O'Sullivan has now been working with a new team on the Square Kilometre Array Radio Telescope, which is a project with its Australian base in the Murchison area of WA. It's a hugely ambitious international project to build a radio telescope which is hundreds of times faster at mapping the sky than today's best radio astronomy telescopes. It's not really a single telescope, but more like a, an array of various antennas spread over a large distance. But just as has occurred in the past, the technical requirements of the SKA are expected to require new technologies that will benefit other areas of the economy. For example, new methods will be required to store and analyse the various data. These methods are expected to have application across a wide range of industries, such as mining, oil and gas, environmental modelling and health. But just to give an idea of the scale, the data collected by the SKA in a single day would take two million years to play back over an iPod. And the dishes of the SKA will produce 10 times the global internet traffic. So hosting the SKA is placing WA in a better position, a position of advantage in relation to the global big data industry. 
And the SKA will be used to answer fundamental questions about science, like how did the universe, the universe form and evolve? Is there life elsewhere in the universe? But I think if you look at the history of radio astronomy, and if you did, if you look at um, C.Y. O'Connor, perhaps the most significant discoveries to be made are those that we can't yet predict. And we can be confident that the thirst for innovation in our state will continue into the future. WA, for example, has had digital startups which have more than doubled over the last two years and have huge growth potential. And the Startup Ecosystem Preliminary Report has revealed that more than 300 local startups are part of a digital revolution that could provide significant growth in our knowledge economy and services exports. So there's much to be excited and optimistic about our shared future. But equally, it's important that we value kindness and compassion in our community. It is fair to say that C.Y. O'Connor received much criticism in the press over a period of time before his death. While he had grown used to being questioned and criticised about his engineering knowledge, the then Sunday Times began publicly questioning his integrity and seemingly no one in a position of authority spoke out in his support. These attacks and the silence of the minister and government wounded him. Depressed, affected by neuralgia and insomnia, intensified by overwork and ne nervous exhaustion, O'Connor needed a respite, not controversy. Unfortunately, the then Under Secretary for Works, Martin Joel, who was a friend and colleague of, uh, who had administered his skill and who would have recommended the appropriate ministerial action, had left the state for a year, so he had nobody to support him. We will never know whether this period of criticism or depression or an agitated state of mind arising from it was a factor in his suicide, but surely it can't have helped. So in, as we heard, in March 1902, C.Y. O'Connor took his own life after 11 years of the most incredible workload. He took no leave at all in this period and was responsible for numerous works across the whole state. Instead of praising him, the press accused him of corruption and incompetence. Uh, I was really fascinated when I read the media extracts and I'll just read a couple of them to get the tone. So one of them said, uh, and this is an extract from the press at the time, it is open rumour everywhere that this Shire engineer from New Zealand has absolutely flourished on palm grease since the first day when the Harbour Works and the Coolgardie scheme were agreed upon. If he is not now immensely rich, there is some mystery somewhere. But in fact, when he died, his estate was worth about 200 pounds, which was a little more than 10% of his salary. There's another prize piece from the media of the day that said, all that O'Connor knows about engineering could, without crowding, be stated in a very small book. So C.Y. O'Connor's legacy to West Australians is that he had the courage through all these difficulties to pursue his long-term vision for public works. He understood that ports are living, dynamic organisms, and in order to service their communities, they need to respond to changing technologies and to expand. At the time of the creation of Fremantle Port, ports all around the world were having to respond to change from sail to steam, from timber ships to, large, to iron ships to larger vessels. I spoke to West Australian of the Year, Anne Carey, recently about what values she thought were important for Western Australia. And she said that the value we needed to develop more was the courage to be kind. I wonder at the time how many people had the courage to publicly or even privately show their support for O'Connor and to advocate for his well thought out views and perhaps even more importantly for him to show their support for his integrity. I know that many of us would have pri tried to do this privately, that is to show support for someone we knew was having a hard time. However, there may be other cases where we may have been unaware of the situation or thought we were too busy or didn't really know the facts and so didn't. But as we can see from the C.Y. O'Connor situation, it is particularly important to help where someone may be suffering from mental health issues arising from criticism or for other reasons. 
So I say that perhaps this is another initiative from the CYO Connor legacy to consider how we can have the courage to be kind and to help people who may be experiencing difficulties, including mental health issues, particularly those arising from public criticism. You may be aware that Anne Carey herself volunteered to go to Sierra Leone to nurse Ebola patients at a time when medic medical professionals treating those with Ebola virus were themselves contracting the virus. As well as learning from C.Y. O'Connor's legacy, Anne's compassion and thoughtfulness might also inspire us to help others who are experiencing difficulties. And I see empathy is a very important part of that. And the recent Festival for Perth had an empathy museum, which was in a shoebox and was encouraging people to uh, walk a mile in the shoes of a stranger, for example, a refugee or a FIFO worker. So in summary, C.Y. O'Connor's legacy to us has not only been the great works of infrastructure that have stood the test of time, but also his remarkable personal qualities, his creativity and his hard-headed reliance on evidence, his firm commitment to a strategic long-term approach and his strength of character. We are also learning to encourage people to talk about mental health issues. It would be also good if we look to speak out, empathise and support others who may be criticised and help them. That is, I believe, an important legacy. American writer Dale Carnegie said, any fool can criticise, condemn and complain, but it takes character and self-control to be understanding and forgiving. It takes courage to continue on course as C.Y. O'Connor did. Equally for those in positions of influence, supporting him at the time when his integrity was being publicly questioned would have taken courage. Hopefully we will de develop a society where we all have that type of courage. I thought I would end with two slides, which I think are quite uplifting. The first, as you can see with, from the dolphins, which regularly swim in the inner harbour, the Inner Harbour in Fremantle continues to have sound environmental stewardship. And this is the type of slide I used to love when I was CEO of Fremantle Ports. You can, and I used to love watching the dolphins uh, surfing the bow waves of the big ships and having fun. It is clear that they, like myself, love the excitement of shipping. Thank you.